Uh, okay, uh, so uh, welcome all to this, um, I would say, extra lecture of the continued learning course that uh, um, we somehow put together at the University of Pisa in conjunction with Continual AI and the AI Doctoral Academy. And uh, so I want, really wanted to have this as an extra lecture and uh, you know, uh, to be in conjunction with what we call uh, the Avalanche Dev Day uh, that um, in, in, you know, the, with the aim of uh, providing a unique event, annual event, to discuss uh, uh, avalanche developments, uh, main efforts, main goals, uh, possible issues, and you know, have a place where we can meet all together, the maintainers, main contributors, and, uh, and people that are interested um, and uh, on, on the on the tool and on continued learning in general, and uh, and all together discuss about the next steps, right? So what we want to to put inside the tool and uh, what would be the priority uh, for its development. Um, and so uh, so I'm sorry that we you see that we are here uh, like confined somehow, but the idea was to 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 have this Avalanche Dev Day as a, also a physical live event within the Department of Computer Science, in this case at the University of Pisa. And so in fact, I invited you all and other people uh, to join um directly physically right and then so but now we, we are confined to these remote um, remote participations i'm sorry for that uh we will try to to make up for it uh, in the next year i guess and but it's nice that at least a few of us that we we have worked so much together for, for this project to be yes. to be to be released uh, in the last year uh and you know uh, some sometimes uh, you know after work hours and uh, you know pushing a lot of efforts um, to really make it possible. And of course, you know, not all the people you can see here have participated to this endeavor, but uh, I want to thank also the people here connected. For example, I've seen Martin and, and, and uh, Matthias and other people that, uh, uh, more than 30, 40 people that actually yes. contributed to, to this development. It's, it's, a, it's a very large uh, collaborative endeavor and I'm really lucky actually uh, to, to, to have worked with so many brilliant people that uh, uh, without whom this project would have never been possible, right? So, and then this, uh, I think it's a, a very nice um, uh, project showcasing the possibilities of what we can achieve uh, within, uh, for example, Continual AI as a community that is committed to, to, to provide support for each other and to work better together, to, you know, within the, the, the context of this topic that we think is fundamental for the future of AI, right? Um, so, um, about Avalanche, um, you know already, if you follow the course and if you have not, you can see the different lectures, uh, more than nine lectures that we have prepared, uh, in which we have different uh, ANSEL session covering some aspects, different aspects of, of Avalanche. Uh, but in general, you can refer to the official website avalanche.continuai.org, where we, we, we keep this as a, as a single, let's say, um, access point everything related to Avalanche, uh, examples, uh, uh, API documentation, uh, uh, tutorials, and uh, further um, links that you can explore to expand your knowledge about it. And uh, and so, um, in, in case you are sure, of course, you can contact any of us here, I believe, and uh, we, we would help you um, not only as I understand some uh, complex features of Avalanche, uh, but also provide support um for integrating your own maybe algorithms into avalanche or even develop your own experiments uh, if we can <laughs> and we have the bandwidth to do so um and for any uh, probably you can contact also us through the links uh, contact at continuali.org this is active uh, for the organization the organization level i would say so uh, that's uh, i wanted to start just by the thanking you again especially these few guys here then the really pushed a lot uh, the, the development of Avalanche. Uh, it was started when I was still back in, in, in the University of Bologna and then uh, and, 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 uh, especially with the support of uh, Antonio and Andrea for, from UNIP was was really you know possible um, to to launch and to develop it at least in the in the alpha stages huh? and uh, so you know, as a, as a, as a you know historical uh, back then in the uh, no 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 as, the alpha <laughs> yeah as an historical notion, I think that it's nice um, uh, like, to say that we we, yeah. we did we didn't start with a with a very you know uh, sharp and super uh, elegant uh, um, proposal right and development, so, but we had to revise the API several times. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that that's quite an important uh, thing to say, right? Because uh, in, in these kind of projects, uh, you need to be uh, not only open to, to change everything, even from scratch, if, if, if something is not working probably, but it means that the avalanche is, is avalanche is not something that uh, came out from from a single mind or a single person, and and that impose uh, it's uh, it's a uh, way of thinking on, on other people or, or let's say a specific direct and a single view, but it's it's meant to be something that is really. Um, trying to uh, be as flexible as possible, at the same time neat and, and clean in, in its API, and that needed much more of the rewriting and iterative, let's say, planning and design. So that's something that we, we actually did, and we are, we are ready to do even in the future if that's uh, usable. Um, and so on this uh, Avalanche Dev Day, we, I wanted at least to cover uh, with the maintainers here, uh, um, Three main, three main, uh, three main sections, the three main parts. So the first one is is really talk about uh, what we're really excited about today. That is the release of the Avalanche beta version. Uh, so that we we, we are stopping <laughs> our first uh, uh, experience with Avalanche uh, without versioning and with you know just uh, limiting, let's say, its usage for experts in continuous learning. And we're ready now to to get more feedback and uh, from usability from uh, different levels and even for people, for example, that are working now um, through the course of continual learning, they are just learn about continual learning, but they want to to uh, apply these to other research areas or you know, developments. Um, then the second part would be more about uh, let's say an open discussion floor for everyone actually, and uh, and so uh, the, we would be open to questions huh, from the community. And for people that have developed with us Avalanche, and uh, we, we can share each other as, as, as our colleagues um, our experience <laughs> and maybe improve on what we have done wrong, right? So that's, that's, uh, that's the idea. Uh, and, uh, and a bit of fun also, yeah, yeah. Uh, doing this in a very informal uh, setting as you're seeing right now. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to also start uh, pushing a bit um, the envelope on what we can do next in Avalanche, what, what we can expect in the next year of development, what do you think, guys, it would be nice to have integrated as a priority and uh, stuff like that. And so we're going to go along, as you'll see, um, um, this is not really prepared, I mean, we have just a couple of slides to, to see that uh, we, we are following a, 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 um, a good plan, right, but, but uh, everything will be like uh, very improvised. Um, okay, so, uh, so I would can say this uh, officially uh, yes. that uh, we are really excited to uh, release the beta version of Avalanche. Maybe we can give a round of applause to everyone here. <laughs> and uh, and and uh, so so um, in in the official um, GitHub repository, you see that there's also a, a roadmap towards the beta, and so. We, we couldn't integrate all the features that we, we plan to do, but at the same time, we, we thought it was finally, you know, this, the, the code base uh, has reached a stable point, let's say, in its development. It has, let's say, fewer bugs and, 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 and consolidated features that would allow to start the versioning of it and the publication of releases. So that's a major step that, right, that we want to take uh, for Avalanche. So uh, we notice that people that are using Avalanche needs also to, to be sure that the, the results, the experiments are reproducible. They have a solid API and documentation they can read um, and can refer to. And that's not changing day from day from day to, to the second day as they install again the bleeding version of Avalanche from the GitHub rail. And so the versioning and, and how, what, what changes from one version to one other uh, will be very much documented and, you know, it's, it's a priority for us. Um, um, of course, we will have maybe minor releases related to bug fix, uh, but what's really important is to have a version documentation, a version software uh, that we can push forward. So we're going to push a lot on these on these aspects and we can discuss maybe, this, maybe in the last part of this um, Avalanche Dev Day about the next steps. Uh, but yes, Avalanche uh, beta is here, and really proud now to say it after like a, a, a day of work. And maybe you can say something <laughs> about it. Yeah, no, no, no <laughs> problem. Totally smooth. Uh, we managed to to have uploaded on the PIP uh, PyPy repository the uh, let's say official uh, first package of Avalanche. So now you can rush and uh, and install it uh, with a pip install command. Uh, that and so that, you, yeah, hopefully, and 
so that you can be among the first 100 people that installed Avalanche from Pete. So that's great. The first uh, gets uh, errors that's... for free. <laughs> exactly, gets errors for free. And plus you have this badge of honor. You can say that was the first uh, testers of Avalanche ever, the beta version. And um, so that's that's quite an important step. So as you you can see that we couldn't use the uh, say the name as you you would imagine Avalanche as it is. And so you 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 need to now memorize this uh, name that is Avalanche Lib and will be the, the official name of the package. Okay, and that's because there I know, Avalanche I think was was already yes. occupied and and we couldn't use it. Uh, not just for the sake of <laughs> articulated. Uh, um, Package versioning. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, so that that was the only slide <laughs> I had for the stable release. Uh, but yeah, so maybe what we can do right now is to um, well uh, talk with you, or maintainers, especially with Antonio, that is now the the, the principal maintainer, let's say, of Avalanche. Because um, as, as you may have seen, I, I, I started to, to you know, to taking less and less, let's say, more technical uh, part of the project. And so I think that Antonio has provided a, a huge support in terms of, uh, of looking at the API, everything in, in, in Avalanche is easy to use. And um, and so has provided a lot of support, technical support towards that. I think that was the, the, the uh, best choice for Avalanche in terms of, uh, of a person that can really oversee the whole effort technically. Um, and um, and so thanks, Antonio, first of all, uh, for this, and, and then we will uh, we will discuss maybe um, a little more something about Avalanche for people that are not really really into the tool. Huh? Um, uh, so one of the things that uh, we also uh, made sure to have uh, in in, uh, in Avalanche uh, the beta release accompanying this uh, this packaged version of the tool. Um, is also uh, a strong, you know, a renewed API documentation. Um, so uh, if you now go to the main link in the in the website of Avalanche, uh, this is the DPI doc um, link, you can now see that uh, that documentation is not completely generated from the, the code base and the, 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 the actual uh, doc strings uh, as it was before, but we, 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 we try to start um, uh, let's say adjusting a bit of documentation uh, so that you have an easier entry point for each module, main module in Avalanche. If you recall the benchmarks, the the the, the models, the, the um, uh, evaluation uh, evaluation training, and you know logging modules, um, uh, so that you you may get and it may be a better idea on on uh, you know uh, let's say on the main um, aspects of each of those main features, mostly of each of those. Uh, without necessarily going through the tutorial, like from zero to hero tutorial, uh, they should be really accustomed to. Um, and uh, um, you can now go a little uh, more in depth because you can you can have a general understanding what each mod module does, but at the same time you can go deeper and look at the different methods and functions and uh, you know parameters as you would do <laughs> uh, uh, um, with with the usage of a normal library. So that's, I think, a good step. So we said that the packaged uh, version of the packages, then this version uh, documentation that is now much improved, I would say. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, with the beta release, we also updated the, the, the Git book, let's say, main Avalanche landing uh, website, uh, so that it reflects the, the latest version of Avalanche. Uh, so that, that won't be versioned, but uh, uh, we we are make sure that somehow the notebooks from the tutorials, the examples, and everything that you can find there is up to date. So now, now if you look at it, there is a, also an update, uh, current release uh, website page where you can gather um, uh, the different uh, the different uh, features that are available with this current release. Then I don't know anything else uh, from the beta release, and you want to say something uh, in particular. <laughs> Maybe the main leader who liked. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't know if uh, we can say. Maybe we can show. A we can show that the diagram. Uh, what do you think? Huh? The diagram. Yeah. Okay. So okay. It's, it is already on on a website uh, uploaded. Yes. Yeah. If you are go on GitBook, uh, uh, go. Okay. You don't. Oh, have sorry. Maybe this is the. Oh, okay. You control don't F. Have the update, yeah. Okay. Control F uh, five. <laughs> 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 Okay. 
Okay, yeah. this is <laughs> this version. <laughs> okay. So uh, basically, we um, we have. When a CD. That, uh, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's probably yeah. not readable, but uh, basically, I think there are two kinds of users for Avalanche. Uh, the beginners, which need uh, the basic documentation on uh, how to use uh, the high-level strategies, and they just want to uh, take the strategies as they are. And then there are the more advanced users that may need more details on the implementation. And we try to uh, support uh, both of them with the new documentation. So we have the uh, the basic tutorial that were there before, like the learn avalanche in five minutes and uh, from zero to hero. And these are uh, designed to uh, help you get up to speed with avalanche. Uh, but then we provide also some um, more advanced forms of documentation, like we have uh, High level description of the architecture here, and it, this should add to make uh, a little bit more clear the decision uh, uh, behind the avalanche and how it works. I, I don't think it makes sense to go into detail <laughs> right now, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, this gives you like the general picture. But then uh, if we added also the autos. So, uh, for example, when you do replay, you need to understand the Avalanche data sets, how to concatenate, how to do the some sampling. And we added uh, a couple of new uh, how to uh, tutorials so that you can uh, uh, learn about Avalanche data sets, learn about uh, the data loading in Avalanche, about the replay. And uh, in with these features, you can give, you can uh, do whatever you want. You can implement uh, every different replay algorithm that comes to your mind. And I mean, this is really big because there are lots of implementation details that we took care about, like uh, doing augmentation, concatenating data from different natures together, and everything works uh, in a very natural manner. There are still some rough edges, but Overall, I would say uh, that uh, it works quite well. And all of us, at least all the advanced users, have done some uh, really weird stuff with Avalanche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's, uh, holding, still holding, it's still right? it's still, it's still holding so quite well. Yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah. But I mean, maybe probably we need more feedback from the uh, outside uh, users, yeah. because while we receive quite a lot of feedback from uh, beginners, I think it's quite hard to receive the feedback instead from the more advanced user that may want to learn uh, Avalanche but needs low level co control. And uh, I mean, we are trying to improve on that front also. And for example, another uh, thing that we did is the API documentation, which now is uh, completely uh, uh, updated, so you can click on all the uh, uh, modules, and for each module, you have, you have a list of all the classes and features of that module, and, and these are organized uh, semantically, like you, uh, similar to what is done in PyTorch. So, for example, if you want uh, benchmarks, you go here and you find the list of benchmarks. So it's very easy to find what you are looking for. And uh, overall, I think the high level components uh, right now are quite easy to use for uh, newcomers and also for uh, uh, more advanced users. And I think mean, that's all that I wanted to say for the presentation of the new features. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can uh, open now the floor, right? So, so we, we, have, we I think that we cover pretty much the, the main elements uh, of this release. Uh, and of course, I mean, for a more detailed, let's say, um, presentation of Avalanche, you can refer uh, to the different lectures of the course where we have this theory and then some sessions, or you can watch uh, several videos we have on YouTube where there is this presentation of what's currently available on Avalanche. So in terms of features, 
uh, you know, um, we didn't add much more with respect to what we have already seen and used. Oh, okay. Much, right? Maybe like, there is something actually. The uh, reproducible, ah, yeah, uh, the yeah, reproducibility yeah, yeah. project. Yeah, so yeah. right now, for every strategy in Avalanche, we also have a script reproducing it uh, with the results from the original paper. And um, we are planning to expand on that, of course. And uh, this will help you, uh, will help us a lot with the reproducibility. So each time that we release a new version, we can check that. Uh, all the strategies still uh, reproduce the results from the uh, real paper from which they are taken. And also people that use the strategies can be sure that what they are using is actually what the paper is yeah. uh, telling. So this is something quite important. And I think it's another uh, big added value of Avalanche because uh, it's quite difficult to find it in independent repositories. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah okay. so that was indeed, the, um, so, so in this last year, essentially, we focused on these two things, right, yes. mostly. So this idea of having an API that is robust and flexible enough so that you can actually do all the things that you would like to do in continual learning with Avalanche, uh, that <laughs> was an important part of the, the development and the, the refinement we did in, in time. Then we realized that uh, pretty much a uh, pretty important priority was indeed the, the aspect of reproducibility, so being sure that what's in our lens is actually correct and yes. usable, right? So these two two priorities. Then we'll see maybe next. Uh, oh, well, I guess these are two still important priorities, but <laughs> but if there are uh, more imminent ones or different uh, things that we want to do in the next year, but yeah, that that's indeed something that we, it was important to uh, underline uh, for this release. And uh, so maybe now we can open the floor uh, to a discussion, right? Among us, among other people here that uh, may have different questions. So for example, we, maybe we can ask, uh, if you move to the actual, um, yeah, maybe we can start. Stop. Start, uh, uh, yeah. Um, Stop sharing, maybe. Oh, well, there's no teams. I don't know. There is no teams here, and uh, I don't. We are not okay. live. Okay. Yeah. It was easier. <laughs> okay, so there now oh, you should. Oh, okay, they don't see us, by the way, anymore. <laughs> camera is black. No, but I think when you share the screen, the camera turns black. No, 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 no it should. No, that's a really. I mean, when you do a presentation, it's a feature. It's a too yeah. high yeah. when you when you show your screen. Uh, Oh, that's uh, of the camera here. <laughs> yeah, we are here. Trust us. <laughs> In the CL Castle. Okay. <laughs> We're good. No, no, we cannot do it anymore. That, uh, okay, that, at least there is this, uh, <laughs> this, this version of the camera. That, oh, okay. <laughs> that, uh, no, no, if this works at some point, Low energy now, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's teams that uh, I was really. Oh, well, at least they see us now. No. Maybe. Um, no. Can't you switch back to the. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's, it doesn't work there, that way. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, in the meantime, you can think about some questions. Yeah, you, may, or you can ask some questions. You can ask because we can hear you, I think. Okay, I don't know why, but it's not working the camera anymore. But, <laughs> but so are you sure that they can hear us? Uh, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, we, we can still hear you. Okay, okay. that's uh, that's good. Okay, <laughs> okay that's good. <laughs> because, I mean, it, it's okay no, no, if the video doesn't work. Of but... silence. <laughs> <laughs> It's a new style. Okay, so maybe we can start um, just by asking if anyone here wants to share that they, their own experience with Avalanche, or what they think, anything actually, and uh, then we can maybe, based on these suggestions, insights, we can uh, we can start uh, making round among us mm -hmm. and say what we think, uh, answer, I don't know, anything. Maybe, maybe we can start with you guys, uh, Ma Matthias and uh, Marty. That he, I know that you used Avalanche for your own projects, and uh, maybe you want to share something about you know some issues that you encountered or uh, maybe some feedback overall. Anything? <laughs> yeah, maybe I can share first. Um, yeah. So yeah, first of all, I want to congratulate the whole team with making such a, an amazing project. 
Um, actually, since, since the alpha edition of Avalanche, I've been using it big time for my own research. So I've had a, a lot of experience with it. Um, and the great thing about it is that it's uh, really modular and while you're working with it, there are these new features appearing at the same time. So it's just uh, really great to, to work with. Um, so um, especially now that there's a, the beta version uh, that you guys are going to include this versioning and all that is, and especially this uh, reproducibility, I think these are like very important things. Uh, if you want to use this, this kind of framework and, and use it for your own code bases so that you can always reproduce whatever results you had before and incorporate, if there are new versions, you can just, you know, download the new version without being afraid that um, your previous results will uh, like disappear. Um, so yeah, for, for me, the, 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 the main um, like things of interest for me really about this, um, the way Avalanche is designed is um, really for me in continual learning, the evaluation is very important and is often very cumbersome if you go over these various settings. And I think because of the way it's really constricted now, um, it's really easy to add these new ways to, to analyze the models you're using to gain insights over the stream you know, you're trying to learn from, um, to look at the feature space, to look at uh, forgetting accuracies, different kind of metrics you, you, you can uh, imagine. And it's really easy to, to define your own uh, stuff there. Um, so, um, a direction I'm going right now with my research is more like on a, a larger scale. Um, so these are just like more large scale benchmarks. And um, uh, something I, I would really uh, find interesting for these kind of setups is also to have like a, a modular way to um, have th this kind of checkpointing. Um, so basically, um, when your job gets interrupted and it has to do a lot of compute, that you have this really easy way to set or get states from all these different plugins that you have. For example, if you have this evaluation plugin, you could just get or set uh, these states. The, the same for uh, different continual learning plugins that you use. If you are using replay or elastic weight consolidation and you have you're in the middle of your, of your processing um, and you have to like, for example, for elastic weight consolidation, you need this copy of your model. Then if you would have this checkpoint and the, also an accessible like API where you could uh, just get or set your state of this plugin, you could just uh, put in this, this new, um, like this model copy that you needed for, for your continual learning plugin. Um, so that's maybe like a, a suggestion that, that I would be really thrilled to, to also see in development. And, and I was also thinking what if that would be possible or uh, if you guys had, had thought about uh, something like that. Sorry, um, uh, Matthias, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we're, but uh, I mean, uh, not that uh, uh, good as before. So um, we lost a bit the connection. I don't know why Teams is uh, is uh, is doing this. Can Can you repeat the last question? Okay. Did, did you hear anything about that I said, or you know, no, most of it, but not all okay. of it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, so, so the last part was um, that then um, um, in my research, more looking toward this more. Uh, large scale setups where actually the checkpointing of um, the state where you actually uh, stop your, your job is actually very important. So if you take these checkpoints, of course, you, you can say in which task you are in, uh, which epoch you are in training and so on. Um, but right now it's still quite difficult for me to, um, because we have these different plugins to have, I really have to dig into the code to be able to um, get which variables I need to, to get from the states, which I have to reset, for example, for evaluation plugin, or for example, in just any continual learning algorithm, um, say um, elastic weight consolidation, 
you would need this model copy um, to uh, get for or your, your like uh, importance weights. Um, so if you could have like a, a single API where you could like get or set states of these different plugins, I think it would become very um, more easier to to uh, really do this kind of checkpointing. And I was wondering if if you guys had thought about this and if there's any plans in this direction. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, I think it's uh, an important uh, feature for sure. Uh, I don't know if we, it will be easy to implement because uh, serialization in Python mm. is not exactly trivial, depending on what you want to serialize. But um, but I think it's it's important because, like you were saying, there are both. Uh, uh, Reason like if you have a stream, a uh, very long stream, of course, at some point you will need to stop and reset. But then you have also like sometime you are running your code in a cluster and your job may be killed for several reasons. So you would like to check points it's frequently to resume it. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's definitely definitely something important and something that you want to do, but we still don't have uh, any timeline about uh, when to do it uh, and or exactly how to do it. Okay, great, thanks. So yeah, I've been working a bit on it myself. Um, so maybe if, if you want, we could have like a, a chat on that and what my experience was on that regard and. Um, yeah, but uh, do you have, uh, like you were saying that you do this manually for each uh, plugin, right? You don't have something general, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for each new plugin you put in there, you have to find which variables are yeah. likely to, to restore the, the state. Um, but of course, if for each plugin that you implement, you have these methods where you just provide these key variables it, it, it this might also be like an option for example if you have like a get or set state method in these um uh, like continual learning plugins and for example in replay you just if you need state of uh, a replay plugin you need to know which samples you have selected before and you can just retrieve yeah. these like indices and you can set and get these states like uh, in this way but of course, that, that would be like a lot of implementation because and prone to to yeah, bugs because if you forget one in, in a certain um, yeah method or or plugin, then then you you won't have it for your checkpoints. You know? um, yeah, I I mean uh, something like uh, PyTorch is doing with modules. Because where where you save only the parameters and then you load them yeah. so you can yeah. Yeah. load and set the state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Replay may be one of the tricky ones because yes. depending on the data sets, you may have open files, and it's one of the things that you can serialize. So mm -hmm. this that uh, replay and data sets are one of the uh, tricky places where uh, serialization is not uh, obvious to do. No, uh, I mean, uh, there, is, there may be one way when you want to serialize instead of uh, just keeping the uh, I don't mean, uh, uh, no, uh, know, it doesn't uh, work. It's the uh, one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, maybe we can discuss about this uh, later during the uh, next steps, but um, I was already thinking about this. This is, in fact, the trickiest part because uh, in replay, you are actually creating a subclass of a data set, and the data set internally is like a, a bunch of a list of files, usually. Um, while for some other data sets like MNIST, you actually have the NumPy blob for all images. So, depending on the data set, you have either a list of files, a, little, a list of tensors, or something in between. So, it's not easy. One current solution will be to store. Your raw data inside the checkpoint, but uh, 
is of course will be quite uh, heavy, yeah. messy. Okay, so if you have uh, like 1,000 uh, images from ImageNet, you have to store the whole images. You can't just store um, the transformed versions or uh, indices or things like that. You have to store the images. Yeah, for example, with MNIST, if you do the pickle serialization, you, you save the entire MNIST. Yeah. Same so for MNIST. I think you know for Cypher, I don't know if Cypher downloads the raw images or just the NumPy blog. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. They have the uh, yeah, serialized blog so that you can so, load. Uh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I mean, so if you just checkpoint that one, you're actually checkpointing the whole data set or at least a part of the data set. Yeah. An intermediate solution would be to keep track of the data set, the original data set, and the list of indices and things like that separately. In this way, you are actually only storing indices, but you have to keep track of which data set they refer to. Yeah. And it's not easy because you can't save an object reference. You have to store some kind of magic string or yes. You have to, I think it's uh, <laughs> frozen again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no. Maybe it's the camera on... itself that is producing problems. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's something not frozen, also the yeah, wheel. No, no, no. Uh, we can do this. Yeah, we we talk about this uh, maybe at the end of the open bar. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Thanks, Ed. So, so Matthias, just to conclude, so uh, this was uh, like a, a need that you showed. Also, this idea that uh, you need serialization. But then I, I remember also in the past you you said that. Uh, you wanted a bit more support in terms of parallelization and multi runs. Is that still the case? Um, I, I would rather focus uh, for me the focus is more on um, like the, the ladder to, to have uh, more of this uh, checkpointing support and serialization. OK. Um, yeah, but indeed, maybe that's something like it was just a suggestion, but. I don't want to mess with your uh, schedule. We can also. Yeah, no, no, no. It's just we are gathering uh, we are building ideas. The schedule, I, exactly. So, and, and so yeah. okay, that would be the, the main focus. I mean, the main uh, feature that you see is missing. Huh? Uh, yeah, I guess. For, yeah, I think uh, especially if you you want to go. Um, also, if you have users, more industrial partners, and so on that, that want to use this. Uh, library, then this more large scale setups become very important. And I think this like checkpointing becomes uh, very important in that. So. Mm, and right, that's true. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matthias, for your uh, intervention. I will feel free to 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 also answer, you know, to uh, some questions if you <laughs> if you have some comments, <laughs> insights. Uh, Thanks. Uh, is that uh, Martin? That I don't know if he's still here. Yes, I see him. I'm still here. <laughs> How are you? I, I can add my two cents, uh, although yes. Matthias has certainly uh, already said quite a lot of nice things. Um, I mean, I also maybe just to start off would like to emphasize that I remember a time like in the very, very early avalanche stage where I tried to <laughs> even just install it for five hours and just to see like how far it came and how um, more easy it has become to use is uh, quite an impressive feat, I think. Um, we've actually, I, like it, has, it has come to a point where we've actually used this in our two most recent papers. And I think that's uh, just uh, already showing that it's um, become a useful tool uh, and not just like a sort of thing to tinker around in, right? Yeah. And um, that's also the, the need I think that has been satisfied for me, at least uh, with respect to class incremental and like uh, supervised experiments where you could now really just reproduce strategies um, in different uh, in different settings and um, just just gauge how how stuff works without having to dig through like 17 different uh, third party implementations of algorithms and um, it's it's really nice to have that um, so yeah big applause on that if you also want like my small sort of um, vision of where I would like to see this go uh, in the future. Um, I think it's a little uh, sort of on a, on a completely different direction to what Matthias has said. I would, um, uh, I mean, I think large scale experiments are super nice, of course, but um, given the nature of like how benchmarks and data streams and so on are implemented in Avalanche, I think it might make quite a lot of sense to think about uh, unsupervised and self-supervised learning and uh, just um, 
yeah. sort of see how certain strategies or maybe even new ones uh, work and now these new um, sort of ways to think about continual learning, right? It's like not everything is uh, includes like class and task labels. And um, I think that would be a super cool thing to think about maybe for like a 2.0 release <laughs> or the 1.0 release, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe this is a, a nice, uh, let's say, um, I mean, point that you made there, Martin, and maybe on this it's uh, it's nice to bring on the table this idea of you know the, the, what we call the avalanche ecosystem, right? So here we have uh, we have different uh, choices, right? We can make so we could extend the scope of avalanche to make it more comprehensive in terms of uh, you know different uh, supervised levels and uh, you know different uh, scenarios uh, and approaches uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, or or uh, we could instead have a more of an ecosystem approach where Avalanche provides the core, let's say, building blocks for machines that can learn from the algorithms, that can learn continually. And then we have uh, an ecosystem of repositories uh, that extends, let's say, in a particular direction, Avalanche mm -hmm. for a focused use case. So uh, we started to play around with this uh, idea um, especially thanks to the effort of Nicolò Lucchesi, who was one of our students. I don't know if he's here. Uh, actually, he wanted to join us physically. Uh, he sent me an email, but now I don't know if uh, he's uh, maybe trying to reach us in the department. So that's unfortunate. Um, but, but nevertheless, he, he pushed a lot for this idea of trying to extend Avalanche um, to better suit, let's say, the reinforcement learning uh, use case scenarios. And it turns out that many of the things that we develop in Avalanche can be indeed used for personal learning, but but uh, you know you could uh, expand Avalanche, and, and essentially creating more levels of abstraction and making them a bit more complex, or you can just let's say patch it in a different repository and add new new things, new new features, um, and you know, without hindering too much the simplicity and flexibility that we have now in Avalanche. So that uh, so we we. We, we went down this second route and, and we are exploring this idea, right? That we think may be very useful, interesting to, to, to add for Avalanche. Uh, so that, you know, the main communities can use Avalanche. Uh, as we know that, uh, just to summarize, uh, I would say 90% of the papers nowadays are focusing on supervised continual learning and uh, computer vision mostly. And so it is, uh, for us at least, it, it, is, uh, it is reasonable to provide more support to do the vast majority of researchers in continual learning, and hence we focus as first steps on this. But at the same time, uh, we may, we may, well, based on the suggestions from the community, we may go down this route of having an ecosystem of, of uh, packages and software that they are built uh, in a more, let's say, let's say a flexible, dynamic, self-adjusting way, instead of a single, you know, code base, that would provide support for everything possible, right? Uh, yes. So I don't know what you think, if you have some ideas here about this, but um, that, I think that was kind of the yeah. thing we discussed, more or less. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, in general, I think that uh, everything that will uh, go inside Avalanche will be uh, quite stable. I mean, not stable, Avalanche is still beta, <laughs> but yeah. in, well, a, in a sense, we have a, a clear idea of how we, we want to do things. Instead, uh, the reinforcement learning right now is separate yeah. because it's yeah. very experimental mm -hmm. and probably over time we will add uh, support for um, a more general uh, mechanism. Yeah. So at some point maybe the reinforcement learning will be uh, so well integrated that uh, we could uh, merge it inside the master. Uh, but yeah, the idea is, is to do this process uh, very slowly yes. So that the, the experimental staff can stay outside of Avalanche, people can experiment with it, but don't have the expectation uh, that yeah. uh, things the, the API will stay the same between version or that we will support it indefinitely, yeah. like we plan to do Avalanche. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. I don't know if that's. Uh... I think so. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, unsupervised uh, learning is a bit easier. Yeah. It's possible yeah. today to do unsupervised learning, but uh, maybe the, um, the API is not as easy because uh, everything is tailored to do um, supervised. Class supervised learning, class incremental scenarios. So 
for example, you create a data set and you expect uh, targets, yeah. Yeah. but you, if you are doing unsupervised learning, you can just put the uh, empty targets yeah. and everything will work, <laughs> but it's not, uh, I mean, it's not user friendly. Clean. No, it's not user friendly. For now, yeah. so it, you need a bit of a more uh, like experience with yeah. the with the main yeah. uh, building blocks and things in Avalanche. Yeah. You can definitely do it, and uh, that, that's why we said uh, before, right? That if you are if you know the internals of Avalanche, you can do almost anything right now with it is, but it's not that user friendly. We will improve yes. on that. Yes, huh. And and so here we have also a question from Mat Mattia San Germano. Hi uh, and. Um, uh, that is asking if we want to extend Avalanche and online continue learn. That's also a question we get uh, every time, right? How yeah. you can create one of online the, streams of data the with these kinds of, of it. Uh, well, we need to pay attention to this because I guess the, there are, the, yeah, no, because there are, uh, so maybe there are many questions on at some point, but that's not uh, necessarily correlated with the high demand in terms of, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, the yeah. Uh, but yes, it's true that, uh, so we also discussed in the course that uh, you have this uh, stream stream of experiences, right? And, that, and each of these experiences have maybe different uh, examples, a set of examples mostly. So one one possibility would uh, there are two possibilities of implementing this framework and online setting. But right? you can have one example for each of the experiences, mm -hmm. or you can have multiple experiences, and you can assume that the algorithm will process them <laughs> in the right way. I think it's also related to the. the uh, you know, so something that was discussed within the, the Matthias fork for the competition, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, the, the, the competition you take all of that. Right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So they wanted to have kind of an online, yes. almost online yes, yes. setting. In fact, in fact, we discussed uh, uh, these days uh, in our <laughs> department uh, because, uh, yeah, the competition is uh, just to uh, brief recap. Uh, yeah, there yeah. are six experiences, and but. Uh, from uh, from this competition, from this particular uh, benchmark, it, it is required that every ten uh, images, so you you have you must yeah. have a, that a mini batch of ten images, ten uh, data points. But after these ten data points, you must be able to test the models. So you you have to um, train and uh, to update the model uh, after ten uh, ten uh, images. So. We are thinking that in this case, the experience it's really composed of ten images. Not, not the experience are not really the large mm. chunk of data. Yeah. Uh, because basically, you can test your model every uh, ten images. You cannot revisit the fast uh, fast images uh, apart from using replay. Uh, so yeah, you have this kind of experiences, but they are not really experience because you can do more epochs <laughs> on them. We are yeah, here again. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so yeah, this is quite, con I would say, online mm. in, this, in this setting, and you can do this on ours, yeah. but it's, yeah. It's not really aligned it's with, not really aligned with the many things are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly as you are saying, so the natural way to do online continual learning in Avalanche is to have these uh, very small experiences, mm. but yeah. the natural way that people think about online continual learning is a large batch that is divided into mini batches that mm. are seen as a stream. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is... Yeah, you, you, you can have both. Because, this is uh, a problem with the nomenclature. Yes. No, if you have both, the problem is that you break a lot of stuff. For example, the evaluation. Mm. Yeah, if that's you have okay. separate yeah, experiences, thing. Uh, all the metrics that are used for class incremental <laughs> are the same in the online uh, yeah, continual yeah. learning. Instead, if you have this uh, hierarchical definition of your scenario, yeah. you you break the data model in some sense. Yes. 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 So, 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 so the plugins, the plugins also, or... like if you want to use it, EWC yeah. in this scenario, it's okay, but you are going to do an update of the importances at every step. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. So, so that's, uh, I mean, it's not easy in general, I would say. So if you look at different implementations, online continuous learning, they would, wouldn't would mostly work on other scenarios. So that's the, the problem. We would like to be a bit general here. Yeah. Yes, uh, also, also some, uh, I don't know, some um, uh, algorithm strategy that works, yeah. for example, in class incremental yeah. learning, yeah. doesn't work in yes. domain incremental learning. Uh, no. So it's maybe kind of... 
yeah, work around, no, not work around, but kind of. Uh, Maybe we have to impose also a vision here and on how to implement yes, online yes. continual learning. Yeah, so, I think we have to provide like uh, an how to guide yeah. mm. where we say online continual learning, you have to do it this way. Yeah. This is, I, then if you want to implement it differently, you are going to break that one. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I also have, uh, because I've been yeah, doing this uh, online continual learning uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Um, the way I'm managing it uh, locally is that uh, I, I, I try to look at base strategy as the more general strategy mm -hmm. that you can have like supervised strategy on top, online uh, strategy. Oh. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm, uh, I've created a, an online strategy that is inheriting from the base strategy and I'm only uh, overloading the, the parts that needs to be yeah. changed. So. Um, uh, online uh, strategy now has a, a different behavior in terms of um, callbacks. Uh, yeah, uh, for example, in that case, you don't have epochs because uh, in yeah, the online yeah, strategy, yeah, yeah. that part needs to be removed. So uh, I was also, um, because when you said uh, we have two different, uh, we thought about two different ways of um, dealing with different types of problems, like uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning, I'm, I'm taking the direction where you have one very, very general strategy mm -hmm. and you have all these different problem types which inherit yeah. that from it mm -hmm. and only uh, change the parts or use the, the functions that are meaningful in that. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, maybe the reinforcement learning case could also inherit from the space strategy that, yeah, yeah. Uh, that could actually... Yeah. No, that's exactly, I think, how was made also in Avalanche or also yes. the specialization yeah. of the base strategy. Yeah, yeah so uh, currently uh, I'm using uh, online continual learning and it works fine, but it needs uh, uh, some some improvement in terms of efficiency mm -hmm. and so yeah. on. So uh, maybe we can discuss it as uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, the, yeah, integrate it uh, somehow to the code. So I, I think it's it's possible, it just needs a little bit of more improvement. Hopefully it's soon in the future it will be there. Yeah. So that, uh, that, that, that was a great question, Mattia, and uh, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, everything is, is a trade-off here, even with uh, not, not just uh, easy of use and, uh, you know, the uh, flexible and uh, comprehensive API, but also eff efficiency, for example. So if you, for example, have one example for each uh, experience as it is implemented right now, you have a different data holder to hold just one, uh, no, one but example. Right? You can change the model. That, yeah. that was something that I wanted to propose after. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this is needed for online continual learning, but it's needed also for uh, reinforcement learning. Because in this kind of environment, you don't really have the concept of a data set, but yeah, you have yes. da a data loader. Yeah. In some sense, mm -hmm. the stream, the stream, the stream yeah. in online continual learning is a data loader. And in uh, Reinforcement learning, you also have data loaders. It's an environment, but the idea is the same because it's something that is giving you input. Yep. You cannot get the entire data set because it doesn't exist. And if you do it this way, uh, you can um, uh, build data loaders that use other data loaders, like the replay data loaders is doing, for example. So you can have a single data loader, the ImageNet data loader, and then each one is giving you only one of the mini batches. And now it's very efficient because you are using the parallelism. For example, the problem that we have is that you yeah. can't use parallelism if your data loader is killed too soon because you lose all the efficiency. Instead, in this way, you have a single data loader that is doing the parallelism and the stuff. And then you have the other data loaders to implement the online mechanism. And, and Maybe it's not super clear right now, but I, I think you understand uh, it's it's the way forward. It's a bit of complexity because, of yeah. course, if you are just doing class incremental, you get the data and it's easier, but it helps also in the generality because, uh, yeah, because of online and reinforcement learning and mm -hmm. some technical stuff for the strategies. Yeah, so that's uh, definitely uh, uh, an interesting question that would maybe uh, pose us um, more questions to address uh, in the yeah. next year. Yeah, so just to conclude, just to yep. what Max was saying, just uh, I, I see the online learning just a two, um, two phase, I would say. So we have the experience, so for example, yeah. reinforcement learning, I don't know, different room in the, in, the, in the same reinforcement learning benchmark, I don't know different environments and so on. So these are the experiences. 
but also each experiences is composed itself of many experiences which are i don't know the the, the actual i don't know, 10 pages from, uh, from yeah. competition or the the, the the minimum 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 best that you can have uh, for online uh, uh, you can revisit the same uh, because you you can revisit the same data yeah. of, of the first experience, <laughs> the big Level. experience. So uh, yeah, it just kind of uh, there is these two kind of experience and I don't know meta experience. Yes, <laughs> no. maybe we can also implement these with task labels. So we can implement this with task the, ma the meta experience would be defined by the change of task labels. Yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. Which could be used uh, without creating the new experiences. Yeah, so but, 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 but maybe we don't want we don't want you don't want to use the task label. Uh, uh, they don't have to be accessible. Huh. By mm -hmm. okay, yes. Yeah, there are many, okay, many yeah. different. Uh, inside the experience, to use. it's not the task labels are inside the data set, and you don't want that. But inside the experience, so another thing maybe we have to do is to separate. What is the training information? Mm -hmm. Like basically, what you get inside the Avalanche data sets is the training information. From what is, it is the uh, evaluation information, okay. because, for example, inside the experience, in theory, if you don't give the uh, experience or, or maybe the scenario is, uh, you can uh, give the, this information about the uh, the meta experience. Yes. Let's call it. Ah, yeah. And. So once you have that, you have this uh, evaluation object, this evaluation information that uh, is given to the um, evaluation plugin, evaluation system, but not the anymore. strategy, the strategy plugin, the models uh, don't have access okay. actually to this. So, so yeah. I think well, we can move on on the next question. I think it poses an interesting. Um, feature that uh, Lorenzo actually had some experience with and uh, maybe can uh, can answer. Uh, so Angelo, 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 I guess, uh, uh, asks, I don't know if you guys have answered uh, this already, but uh, he wanted to know um, if we, we plan to implement a multi-GPU support. <laughs> Next <Excellent. laughs> OK, yeah, so um, I will uh, also link to what Matthias said about the checkpointing. Uh -huh. So my general idea for the one of the first the next steps for Avalanche will be to go uh, towards a model, no model parallelism, at least data parallelism, so mm -hmm. multi-GPU training uh, uh, even on multiple machines. Mm. Uh, so basically, that will mean implementing a way to reproduce the code and make the code aligned across multiple processes uh, by using the Torch distributed packets, because you usually use that um, mm. package. So Torch distributed is used yeah. also to do detection, but also inside Detectron, other uh, libraries uh, that allow for distributed training uh, using packets. So that's the, uh, let's say, our entry point. And in order to do this, we also have to create a way to checkpoint uh, the data, uh, the status of the code. Because usually when you run these kind of long computations, uh, your job may get uh, just uh, preempted or killed and then re-executed later by some kind of scheduler. So we have to account for this. So, uh, so these steps will be to implement the checkpointing and uh, GPU parallelism in uh, some kind of a single effort in the next step. But it can be done. <laughs> so I, I still, uh, I'm still thinking about this, but I have some ideas. Uh, it's not as easy sure. as running a single script you download from yeah. uh, Torch, Vision, Tutorials, and then uh, you click and run and it works uh, just like that. We do a lot of strange things inside Avalanche, like uh, some setting data sets and uh, creating, uh, we have to create a benchmark, okay. It has to be created with the same seed across all processes, and there has to be some kind of synchronization. And what if we use the replay plugin, who updates the buffer, the first process at the rank zero, and how it transmits this uh, yeah. uh, choice of replay instances to keep uh, all two other uh, processes. And there are a lot of things to be answered, so we will be designing a decent solution for this. Uh, uh, to cover both checkpointing and multi GPU uh -huh. training, so it's our uh, is our is in our let's say uh, backlog. Yeah, so, so I'm curious, uh, Angelo. So do, do you have uh, 
um, an answer on where you would apply this uh, multi GPU support. Just something that you think uh, would speed up your own experiments. So you have a strong requirement, let's say. Uh, I'm just curious. I don't know if you can write it on, on the chat or you want to open your mic and, uh, and, and tell us. Uh, um, yep. All right. Can you guys listen to me? Yeah. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yep. yep. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the answer, uh, Lorenzo. Um, I actually, I'm right now working with continual object detection, incremental object detection. <laughs> and what happens is that um, at least for training the baselines, I need multi GPU because, you know, lots of images, the batch size is really small, but you, we need to figure out ways to do to deal with this. And the problem that I have right now is because I'm implementing pretty much everything with PyTorch Lightning because it has ways of dealing with the data parallel, parallelism better than, I don't know, other libraries. And I tried to do that with Avalanche. And I mean, like I tried, it was a little, you know, difficult for me to grasp. And that's why I actually had in mind to ask you guys that. Yeah. And I believe we could, we could get some ideas um, from their implementation, even though it has some issues and known issues. Uh, I mean, like the PyTorch Lightning one, but um, I mean, like it could be a good start. Uh, thanks. <laughs> No, absolutely. Thanks, uh, uh, Angela. I think that's uh, exactly why we also wanted to push a bit the multi GPU support, the data parallelism support in Avalanche. And then uh, uh, Lorenzo worked a lot on, on the object detection yeah, and yeah. Uh, continual learning uh, for detection. Yes. Yeah. Why, why don't you type in, uh, Ah, yeah, nice. I wanted to ask. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Lorenzo thinks it's uh, easier to do the multi GPU ourselves. Ah. Or try to integrate lightning. lightning. <laughs> this this will mean that we will be like something on top of PyTorch Lightning. Yeah. Exactly. The the issue is that uh, well, PyTorch Lightning is excellent because it really simplifies simplifies a lot of things, but uh, it doesn't really change that much because we mm -hmm. have to manage yeah. the parallelism, the parallel parts of Avalanche. It's not oh, that we yeah. just plug yeah. uh, lightning. It's mm -hmm. like uh, okay, we decide to plug Detectron 2 to run Detectron things, and Detectron 2 has the uh, distributed computation embedded already implemented. But uh, mm -hmm. we will still have to <laughs> implement uh, parallelism inside of Avalanche. It's basically related to how we uh, exchange data, data mm -hmm. across processes and keep the state aligned for all processes. Mm -hmm. uh, replay plugins, plug uh, or the evaluation metrics, uh, uh, logging, uh, uh, also the creation of the benchmark. So the first lines of code, how the benchmark is created. <laughs> so we use the un unique seed and maybe also reload that uh, benchmark instance if uh, the uh, process has to be checkpointed and something like that. So. Uh, Lightning would be enabled by uh, a more better managed parallelism uh, mm -hmm. by Avalanche. So mm -hmm. if we can manage to implement uh, this kind of parallelism and synchronization inside of Avalanche, then I think that we can also consider implementing the support for Lightning, but if it's not already supported as it is. Yeah, no, can. because they thought that Lightning would help with the multi if it doesn't, I don't know. We, can, don't know we can borrow some ideas. We can borrow some ideas by looking at the code. So it basically uh, is a thing of studying uh, uh, best practices mm -hmm. through this mm -hmm. kind of synchronization. And we yeah. can definitely look into other uh, factors mapping to find out and so, learn something. Yeah, so it's better to uh, do our uh, own uh, multi processing belt for line of battle slightly because you, you basically have to. Do the multi processing uh, in any case. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we need to figure out uh, something that is clean uh, and can be extended. Yeah. So if we want to add a new plugin, which is usual stuff uh, for a strategy, it doesn't have, we don't have to get uh, crazy just to uh, fit the parallelism inside that plugin. Yeah. So it has yeah. to be some kind of decent way to... Yeah, and I, and I will also say for, um, for the future of Avalanche, if we include multi-parallelism, multi, multi GPU processing, multi-parallelism, and so on, that if someone wants to, uh, I don't know, uh, develop a new plugin for its own uh, strategy, you don't also have to uh, 
develop all the multiprocessing. Exactly. Yeah, so you, you have to actually you write your plugin yeah, and yeah. multiprocessing is, uh, yeah. it's, uh, in many cases, maybe managed by ourselves in, yeah. <laughs> inside yeah. Avalanche. Yeah. Because if uh, okay. if every person has to also write uh, all the code for the if we have the checkpointing like Lorenzo was saying in theory you can just uh, serialize exactly and that's <laughs> why I, 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 I talk about implementing checkpointing and parallelism in uh, yeah. in parallel no yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, one requires the others <laughs> yeah, exactly mm -hmm. they are strictly done we, we have pipe design yeah um, so. Okay, so this is an important point. Maybe we can discuss it again in the latest part, the next steps. Um, and then we have another question from Elliot uh, um, saying that earlier we mentioned the difficulties with unsupervised learning. As I is looking in particular uh, to implement variational autoencoder, what do you think you would uh, need in terms of modification so that you can uh, learn to minimize? Uh, okay, so <laughs> to minimize reconstruction error. Uh, so in the base strategy, loss function is applied to targets and predictions, which isn't really applicable to variational encoders. So it's true that by default, the loss function is applied to the targets and the um, prediction of the model, but it's something that it can be uh, overridden. You either do a subclass of the base strategy, or um, there is a way to pass a, a custom loss function yeah. also. Uh, but if you want to change the argument, I think you have to override it, override it and do a, a subclass. But this is totally doable and yeah. already supported. And uh, but I think you also can simply re redefine the MBY property of the base strategy by subclassing the base strategy. So if you take yeah, the yeah, I mean, MBY as MBX, oh. you obtain the reconstruction error for free, basically. Yes, yes, kind of happy because. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, if it's just for the sake of application. No, no, because there are other, other plugins that may use the. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah, but in your case, the target is actually your X. So. OK, OK, yeah, if you just want to train the um, the variational okay. autoencoder, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah just for this, of course, just for this application, that, that's not something uh, one can merge in our, let's say. But for the application, yes, you can just redefine the property MBY to be mm. self dot and batch zero, which is the actual input. Yeah, so, so there are, um, so in, uh, for this specific problem, there are many ways that you can even work yeah. around that. We really should, uh, uh, should, should do like how tos for general cases of unsupervised learning. Yes, yes. absolutely. Then when we have uh, a specific API better supporting, it's okay. But for now, it's, it's still possible and yeah. we should allow at least for basic experiments, yeah. would be would be useful. So, so like, this is a very quick like, and how to with the online control learning example. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if we decide to go with the subclass, probably at some point it will be mm. something in the API yeah. but with subclass. Yeah. And, and then something also with the unsupervised learning and just an example of a custom mm. loop with custom targets, custom loss. Yeah, it should be so um, and uh, I mean. So, uh, of course, uh, Elliot, if you have any more questions, you can ask directly on the discussions tab on GitHub, where we, we actually try slowly, but uh, but somehow steadily uh, to answer all the questions and to provide support to the user base. And uh, so it, it also happened in the past that so we started with a particular callback definition and way in which the base strategy is defined, and then we tweaked that based on, on this kind of feedback, right? So thank you so much for that. We really need to know how people are using the base strategy in Avalanche really to create all these subclass of the base strategy or to change even the, the, the actual callback system. So, um, and, and we are, you know, uh, making that this, you know, general and more and more and more general as we move forward. So that's great. Um, and um, and we will uh, definitely provide these maybe autos to better understand how we can do that based on these uh, feedbacks, even on uh, difficulties that may arise in the application of Avalanche. Um, then I don't I don't see any more questions. But if you have some, this will be this will be the, the, the perfect time to ask more questions directly. If you're using, if you just started, Ava, uh, you know, developing with Avalanche, 
And maybe I can also say at this point that uh, uh, it's obvious for, for us, that, uh, but maybe not for, for all, that we, we're always looking for new contribution, contributors and even maintainers. I mean, uh, we're totally open for, you know, um, to, to have people that can actually not only develop more, you know, some features about, about the tool, uh, but and provide maybe implementation of their own strategy, you know, yes. back um, to the community to be used uh, and, and be deployed in, in other experiments that he is, uh, but also to, to work with us as, as we are doing today to, 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 to understand what we can improve in Avalanche, how we can do it and uh, Define the priorities, you know, we really work and helping other people, right? So, we really work at the maintenance level. Um, that's totally, totally uh, something we would like to see as, uh, as we are just a few of us and uh, we're not, we are not uh, full time on Avalanche. So, this, will, this should be, and, and, and I think we'll be a uh, collaborative endeavor and something very well distributed in terms of both objectives, priorities, and uh, collaboration. And so. So that's that's something I want to stress out here. Yeah, I mean, there is also a place for a small contribution. Yes. For example, now that we have the reproducibility repository, this is something like if someone uh, is able to reproduce an experiment that we are missing, uh, this is like a great contribution for the community because then we can add it to the battery of experiments and make Avalanche more solid. Absolutely. Uh, even smaller ones, we have a number of uh, good first yes. issues that you can check on. I mean, if you spot a bug or something yeah. that it does, doesn't work as, as expected, yeah. you can open an issue and try to fix it yourself. It, it's it, simple. Yeah. You can, uh, so this is also for, for, the, for the people who are following the course. So one of the possible, let's say, um, exams, uh, parts of projects they can use for the exam. No, no, it's actually uh, to our, uh, <laughs> it's actually a possibility. It's the only exam you can. Uh, a, possi <laughs> a possibility would be to to just uh, take on an issue in Avalanche, and so that they can showcase that they know the tool and they know about the theory of continuous learning, and just uh, yeah, they can implement so. distributed uh, training. <laughs> <laughs> if you want yeah. maximum grades, so you that would be the... that would be a total pass on the exam <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a positive evaluation. One hundred percent score. Yeah. Case. So okay, so we have uh, a question here. That, uh, okay. Thanks from Elliot, thank you Elliot actually. And yeah, is there see. any PhD position in uh, this research group? Well, that's actually, true. yeah, so we, we have many uh, positions open every year. Unfortunately, for this uh, year, the enrollment were closed um, a few months back. Yes, yes, in uh, late summer. So, so in Italy, what, 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 uh, what happens is that uh, around uh, like May, in summer, May. May, even before, there are open yes. calls for PhDs uh, here at the University of Pisa, in particular, we have uh, several of those positions. Actually, this, this year, I think uh, all the candidates that, uh, that actually submitted their, their, their application for, the, for working in, in continued learning, especially, they, they got accepted here. Um, so there is a, a good space uh, now for, for applying uh, in next year, I guess. Yes. Uh, these are just uh, one every year. There's uh, open calls for many positions every year. and. Uh, and so I really invite you, or people that will follow these maybe later on YouTube, uh, to, to just apply or send an email to us that we can forward, you know, uh, to you the, the actual uh, uh, official calls. Uh, yes, and just, just to yeah. uh, add something in Italy, uh, you cannot hire directly. Yes, you exactly. You have to pass from all the um, university, know, official, university official uh, calls. Exams, and calls. Exams. Yeah, so, but, but we can redirect you to exactly do the appropriate yes. uh, calls and uh, give you a bit of advice. So now you yeah. can you can uh, you can uh, you can try to, to to submit a decent proposal. And um, and and then I want to say also the fact that uh, we we're not just I mean, there are other positions available, not just for PhDs, also for research assistants and postdocs. So in case you have some experience in continue learning, you can reach out to me in this case if you want and. Uh, and we can chat about different possibilities, availabilities that we have in our lab, but even in friendly labs, like for example, the one. Like our lab. <laughs> like lab. I mean, we are not just a single reserve. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are Avalanche. distributed. Uh, yeah, I was, distributed, uh, I was mainly, mainly talking about the, the, the lab that we were working here, the University of Pisa, that I have a bit of a uh, 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 saying. Um, say. but, uh, but of course, uh, if you're talking about continual AI, you can check the different uh, labs that are working with us um, at uh, you know the research page um, and 
and you can ask directly the principal investigator of those labs uh, in case that's that's of interest. Um, then anything? OK, we have OK, thank you. OK, perfect. Um, and OK, so um, if you don't have any more questions or in, you know, uh, particular comments, uh, I think we can move very quickly because uh, we, we don't have a lot of time. We, we can close a bit uh, earlier instead of spending two two hours. <laughs> um, we can discuss a bit uh, what do you think uh, about the next steps of Avalanche, we, what we can focus on, I would say in the next year, so if we could make yes. it a bit more general, but we may have different uh, objectives, even a milestone, so we can maybe come up with uh, uh, in the next six months or so, right? Uh, so what do you think? I don't know, maybe Antonio as a as yeah, SPI. So yeah. The checkpoint yes. and the multi-GPU distributed learning support is a really big feature, which mm -hmm. will take basically uh, all years. of Lorenzo's <laughs> efforts. Yeah, uh, yeah the effort is spread, I think, uh, across all uh, modules, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah uh, I mean, we have to start from somewhere. If we had to start from somewhere, is the benchmarks module. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be the first, very first step figuring out how to synchronize the benchmarks module, the avalanche leads, and things like that. Uh, they are not quite, uh, maybe not quite easy. So mm -hmm. that would be the first step. Um, talking about the benchmarks module, getting rid of the um, mandatory target spill. Yep. <laughs> I was thinking about some kind of instruction to uh, disable task labels so mm -hmm. completely. Um, let's say, prevent them from uh, uh, being uh, mandatory, mm. like obtaining a version of the data set that doesn't output the task labels, or a version of the data set in which the task labels are enabled and visible again. Um, it's like, uh, uh, if you um, have a look at the how-tos about the avalanche, avalanche yeah. data set, um, there is now a section, a uh, world guide on transformations, Mm. which are more uh, powerful than the classic torch vision like in the classic torch vision data sets. Basically, when you add transformations, replace transformation, add groups, uh, things like that uh, in uh, an avalanche data set, you always get a copy of that data set, a view of that data set, and the original data set is never changed. So yeah. it, it, avalanche data sets are like immutable objects. Which is very good because you can obtain a version of the data set in which you have a different set of transformation and so on. You can do something like that using task labels. So if that in a certain part of the code you want to ignore task okay. labels, you can just get a view of the data set okay. without task labels. You just call without task labels okay. on that data set and get the data set without task labels. Then in an, another part of the code, yeah. Someone, uh, some other plugin or something uses the same data set and uh, calls uh, with task labels, and task labels are enabled again. But the original data set is never changed. So that would be uh, an idea to enable yeah. and disable task labels. So, this, uh, just to understand, would be mostly to make sure that maybe some strategies, for example, they don't use uh, task labels, labels. they say maybe that they don't want to use it, or maybe, or maybe there's another ah, maybe use case that you were thinking about. Strategies that uh, just ignore task labels yeah. may just disable task okay. labels, so they can just X and Y. Yeah, maybe the, the thing that we uh, said before, so maybe the task labels are visible only during the uh, the model during the training, but not during yeah. evaluation, just to okay. do some kind of strange, uh, you know, uh, so I thought a little bit about this. Maybe this is too technical for the call, but we can discuss it later. But I was thinking that uh, instead of having um, special attributes, you can have just in general, like uh, an avalanche data set is doing a couple of things. So there is the data, like the samples, the target animated item, then you have the um, in transformations, and then you have the subsampling and concatenation operation, and then you have these attributes like the targets and the task labels. So we can treat it probably in a more general way, like these attributes are basically some in vectors Thanks. where you have an a piece of information for each input sample, so you can have uh, this vector of targets, this vector of uh, task labels. You can have task vectors, for, for example, with this solution. You can even have uh, something like, uh, uh, I don't know, attach other information. Some, some replay, for example, if you have buffer, you can use 
you can attach information that you need to do the some sampling, like the logits of some model, I don't know. And then you just have to make sure that the concatenation and subsampling propagate all this information. Yeah, I mean, I, I it needs a, a lot of work to do it no, internally, maybe. No, but it will probably simplify the code base a, li a lot because, uh, yeah, if you set some sample, you have to recreate the target speed based on the indices of the buffers. Mm -hmm. This same thing yeah. for test labels and Usually it's a lot of duplicate code with a few exceptions like the task label side to be integer, so you have to do some checks and things like that. Uh, targets doesn't have to be uh, vector of pins and things like that. If we can simplify this kind of thing and create maybe just a, a class or something to tell this field as to behave uh, like target, the target field, so uh, subsetting applies to it, uh, concatenation applies to it, and things like that. We could enable for arbitrary fields in the data. Yeah, yeah, it's like a registration mechanism, like the parameters in. Yeah, Python like uh, maybe you just create your data set and then you do dot uh, this field, mm -hmm. arbitrary name uh, equals uh, mm -hmm. a name of a class we have to come up with. <laughs> Uh, that uh, tells you that uh, this field has to be a like a target field. Mm -hmm. task field. Yeah, so that would be. Uh, I think it will simplify a lot because yeah. it's there are all the special cases because maybe there is also the com conversion that it's done internally in the class, so we bring this outside. Makes and things a little bit easier. Uh, there are there are a lot of uh, things strange inside Avalanche dataset to <laughs> enable <laughs> targets and task labels, especially if you. Uh, there are a lot of situations uh, managed by this. So if you just uh, split a data set with, by using the Python to train and test split, uh, it creates two subset, types of Python subset. Uh, but I have to explicitly uh, enable traversing the Python subset to reach the target field in the in a data set. And the same thing for task labels uh, and uh, flattening of uh, the tree. Of data set concatenation, subset concatenation, subset <laughs> concatenation, subset. There are a lot of things that could be generalized by using this thing. Uh, that would be great. So that would be a nice refactor. Uh, but, okay. So, wouldn't change much also the eye level. No, the from so, the outside, you know, from the outside, yeah. Yeah. just the, the sure. difference is that uh, doing stuff like object detection or supervised mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, will more make. M much easier and more natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, maybe this is. Okay, so we, we're, if I can recap, so we're talking about possibly internal refactoring. That's always possible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of, uh, let's say, especially features that the users can expect, let's say, for the next uh, few months or like six months, right? Oh. Uh, so, first of all, let me ask you this. So, do you think that in a year or in six months or whatever, we may think of adding like a stable version of Avalanche or not. Mm. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> so I, I don't think a stable, yeah. but something that we have to decide mm. is um, how do we want to release the new version of Avalanche? Because yeah. uh, I mean, to me personally, it makes sense to have a, a better release, mm. but uh, try to be uh, quite frequent, maybe having schedules like every n months. Mm. Like we can do uh, mm -hmm. two releases per year, four releases per year. The, the exact number doesn't mm -hmm. mean much because, I mean, we have the test and we have the reproducibility, so we can be quite sure to yeah. that we, the release are uh, relatively stable. Mm. But that way we can uh, maybe push new features more easily instead of waiting mm -hmm. one year to be sure that we have uh, a large there will be more releases yeah, uh, before yeah. this table that's that's will that's for sure i mean we cannot uh, otherwise the bugs we will <laughs> we saw to, tomorrow will be published in a year so yeah no no no, no. for sure bug fixing uh, will trigger yeah. releases at least yeah so but I, I think that this also really depends on the community out there. Listen, <laughs> so we can implement all this kind of refactoring of the yeah. low level, which will enable mm. easy applications for unsupervised, so you can work uh, better in a diverse setting. But if we 
don't gather together uh, new strategies working, exploiting these, uh, these features, it's hard to understand uh, whether they are stable. Or, yes. I mean, we cannot test everything. So also we need the, the community and time to, to understand whether the, the modifications we made are, uh, will become stable or not. And, and remember that Psychic Learn just became stable. <laughs> so, yeah. like, uh, ah, yeah, a library yeah, yeah, yeah. years of experience is it's true. Like the most, stable version. Most the libraries okay. take years yes. to, to become stable, yes. and even with much more development power yeah. that we can uh, yeah. Yeah, provide yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. Psychic yeah. Learn case, I, I mean, it's. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, we have another, another question on a more general level. and uh, from Angela as well. Um, so he says uh, that for big techs, learning continually is treated more as a ML ops problem. Yet much of what Avalanche and Academia proposes is to make changes in the way we frame the learning problem, so different models and learning strategies. When do you guy, uh, guys think will be the parting shift for these companies? So, so in, in my own, uh, let's say, imagination, uh, so it is true they're working more on an infrastructure level. Uh, while in academia, we're focusing more on the algorithms, you know, given a, a model, uh, you have a, a strategy so that you can update the model based on new data, new evidence, new observations, okay? Uh, and, and so, so the, I, I don't see them as like diverging. Instead, I see them as quite uh, complementary in a sense. Because uh, nowadays you are more and more involved, uh, uh, let's say, MLOps, uh, complex uh, operations and protocols so that you may, you can have different uh, guarantees out, out of it, right? And uh, so continual learning is there already somehow because these are continuous integration processes uh, and they are moving more towards real time and you know, everything that is working as it is expected, checking, well, you know, checking and, and uh, Creating checkpoints and uh, you know saving everything, um, making sure that they respect the quality of service indicated. Everything, uh, but just moving from standard software development practice towards something that is more composed of different uh, predictive models. So uh, essentially, all the good practices are now changing to you know uh, more AI, let's say, related approaches. That is why from DevOps it, it is moving to what's called MLOps, right? And AI ops, I, I heard. Um, but then, uh, then uh, what we are developing, I think it can be seen more of as a kind of a plugin uh, into this system uh, so that uh, you can leverage these algorithms and these ideas, these approaches in continue learning to actually improve that uh, uh, um, updating step of the model instead of starting from scratch. Of course, all of these may be optimized and engineer engineered in these more complex protocols, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think that, that, that as soon as we, as a community, we pre provide like algorithms that are robust <laughs> enough that you don't have to be tweaked uh, uh, in terms of hyperparameters and can be robustly applied to different situations, I think that they will be engineered as, as the next step, and maybe that we will see some different uh, and interesting intersections in terms of uh, envelopes, uh, protocols, uh, proposal, the design of these protocols and uh, operations uh, with respect to specific native strategies. Like for example, first one. I think uh, we'd be engineered is the replay, right? Approaches, and they are there are already uh, there are already some. Uh, we talk about this in the course. Uh, so there is, for example, this TensorFlow extended implementation that already is based on this idea of uh, well, having access to all the data accumulated over time, but at the same time, for example, starting from a, from a previous uh, computed uh, model, learned model. So with these warm-minute strategies that they imp implement in a more complex ML pipeline that is supporting the uh, recommender system of uh, Google Play, for example. So, that, so you see that, that that's, uh, I think that they are quite um, complementary. It's just the fact that, as a, in terms of algorithms, we are, we are still in a, in, a, in the early days, and we cannot provide so much stableness and uh, support. Yeah. Right? But I mean, also, I think well, when you think about this uh, ML DevOps solution, most of them provide, in some sense, a solution for the easy. It's, I mean, not not the easy part, mm -hmm. but it's uh, easier to provide an integrated solution for the deployment, for storing the model, for the versioning, but providing something that allows you to uh, plug different algorithm, training algorithm in your pipeline, it's very difficult. I don't think there's anyone doing anything like it. Mm -hmm. If you think like in PyTorch Lightning, for yeah. example, provides 
a single training loop that doesn't provide the algorithm implementation. Yeah. So even uh, so what we are doing with Avalanche is something that is really difficult to find in, in yeah. other libraries. It's like we are providing the base strategy plus, and the next step is the ability to integrate together different strategies yeah. or to combine different yes. scenarios. It's something, if you think Keras provides the model, like yeah. Chilai can provide the this basic alone, loop, but no one cute. is providing this, uh, yeah. the learning algorithm. Yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, that's uh, so I've seen a couple of uh, interesting uh, projects that are aligned with this idea. So that, but, but are more focus on reproducibility, right? So, so and, and indeed, the, we, we design Avalanche somehow. We were pushing it forward with this, uh, with this twist, uh, this, this particular flavor, right? It's quite innovative, I believe, because uh, it is it, it at the intersection of providing a tool that you can use flexible modular, blah blah blah, that you can use for your experiments at the same time. Providing this support for vertical disability and having all the baselines that are you know, implemented and tested, uh, so it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, um, double of the same coin, right? And uh, and there are, for example, in the project the dopamine. I don't know if you heard of it. Uh, reinforcement learning work was based on these kind of ideas, um, and there are a couple more of these uh, you know, that were proposed in the past, but. Uh, but there are a few that are, let's say, quite successful. It's a lot of effort, as you, yes. as you may have seen. Yes, maybe more <laughs> the uh, reinforcement learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah more the reinforcement learning. Yes, also, so for example, the stable baseline. Stable baseline. Kind yeah. of See, in, in stable baseline, for example, yeah. you have uh, like the baseline algorithm. But then, for example, if you want to uh, do EWC with stable baseline, yeah, I don't think. I, I mean, maybe you have some kind of callback system. They have a have very a, basic callback system, yeah. They, they don't have a mechanism to combine yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every algorithm is separate, yeah, yeah. then you can extend yes. it with callback, but yes. they are more, more thought out for logging purposes. Yes, maybe that's true. The that's kind true. of stuff that you do yeah. with callbacks like checkpointing. Yeah, no, no that, that's a quite indeed the original aspect of Avalanche, the plugin system. Uh, and, uh, and yes, okay, that, Assumes the fact that there is something that is a callback system that is uh, quite uh, general, and then the fact that uh, you can compose different plugins. So this is quite uh, innovative, I believe, in terms of you know support, not just for the engineering or software engineering aspects, but for the, the algorithm design as a plugin system. Like quite original, I think. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's, it's always like works like magic for me, like seeing the fact that you can plug in uh, AWC and replay. With a few lines of code, so it's like magic for me that I have to implement every other everything like this from scratch, right? Uh, Maybe I'm just <laughs> the version of it now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Angela, for your question. I think it was nice. Uh, ah, yes, I, I, Matthias. Okay, he already went away, but uh, was uh, was nice to discuss. Um, okay, so I think we can close up right yeah. now, and I. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so we will uh, we always uh, let's say uh, continuously discussion somehow uh, in the discussion tab of uh, GitHub. Everything is open yes. there, and, and so uh, we have a few sections in which we can also discuss more openly and not particular issues, but ideas related to Avalanche. That if you, if you look at the discussion tab, you see there is a section um, and feedback ideas, general ideas. Uh, then of course we meet we meet every every week actually for uh, with Avalanche almost every week almost yeah almost every week uh, with the maintainers and uh, this is open we we often uh, link the, the 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 meeting on on Slack uh, I wasn't that present uh, recently in Slack but I, I think that uh, that's, that's still the case um, and uh, so we are open to to host your questions ideas uh, you know every week um, on Wednesday around six uh, yeah. Um, and so that's still open, and uh, and we can still continue discussion even on Slack. There's appropriate channel for this uh, on Slack, on the continuous AI Slack. So we can uh, continue this discussion over time, and uh, we will keep you all updated about uh, the the different let's say decisions that they are made, uh, and uh, especially uh, trying to 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 have a, 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 an updated roadmap after these beta yes. release. Okay, so. Thank you all for coming today again and for your attention. 
and I hope to see you all again uh, soon, uh, even in person. You know, one of the the, the next meetups of Continual AI and and uh, and uh, future conferences. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 bye.